Okay, good morning. Uh, now our, all of our speakers are here. Uh, and we'll get started. Uh, this is UBI's Grand Rounds, and uh, we chose to uh, discuss the white dot syndromes, uh, principally because um, it's snowing like uh, heck outside. It's really, that's one of our white dot syndromes. But also, the white dot syndromes are a collection of inflammatory chorioretinopathies that uh, are actually quite confusing uh, to. Uh, ophthalmologists and retina specialists and UBI specialists alike. We will, there's no better way to illustrate this than through case presentations, but I thought I would start with a little overview uh, to see what we're getting into here. So the white dot, dot syndromes are a heterogeneous group of non-infectious retinal inflammatory disorders that have overlapping clinical features, which makes them somewhat confusing. They are characterized by multiple well-circumscribed whitish, yellowish lesions at some point in time in their uh, course in the uh, outer retina, RPE, choriocapillaris, or choroid. This is a list of the white dot syndromes, okay? So an example is Bergschott retinal chordopathy is illustrated in this uh, photograph here. With all of these lists, it's, we do keep lists in our heads when we look at patients to try to put them into a category. Sometimes it's, it's useful to actually think of them in categories and in groups. So for example, the placoid lesions are, uh, are uh, illustrated by AMPI, serpiginous chordopathy, relentless placoid chordopathy, and persistent placoid maculopathy. The placoid kind of gives it away a little bit, but this is an example of AMPI. We can also think about them in the groups of the multifocal choroiditic uh, processes, such as multifocal choroiditis and panuviasis and PIC, which we will be discussing today, uh, progressive subretinal fibrosis syndrome. And then there's a group uh, that Don Gass had uh, put together, the Azor complex, characterized by multiple Evanescent white dot syndrome, uh, Azor, uh, acute idiopathic blind spot syndrome, which may be uh, part and parcel of the same type of syndrome. We need to keep in mind that uh, there are many other things that can produce white dots in the retina, such as these infectious diseases, non-infectious diseases such as sarcoidosis or sympathetic ophthalmia. This is a uh, patient with uh, tuberculous choroiditis, producing a white dot. And the, this is actually a patient uh, with tuberculous serpiginous-like choroiditis that looks very much like serpiginous choroidopathy that needs to be treated with anti-tuberculous therapy initially. So the white dot syndromes have many shared features. Demographically, most of them are under the age of 50 with a couple of exceptions such as birdshot and serpiginous. There's a female predominance in many of them. They present usually bilaterally, but sometimes very asymmetrically. Patients frequently will have photopsias, blurred vision, nyctalopia, floaters, and visual field loss, and a blind spot enlargement is not uncommon. About half of the patients will have a viral prodrome. Uh, this is particularly true of uh, mutes, uh, multifocal choroiditis, uh, and RP and ampi. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned to you before, they can be grouped in in certain types of, uh, sorry about that, they can be grouped together as GAS did in the Azor complex. Whether or not this really holds true in terms of pathogenesis remains to be seen. The pathogenesis is really unknown. We really do not know what caused them. Some have, uh, there must be an automatic timer, I apologize. Um, the, there may be uh, an infectious etiology, GAS is hypothesized a viral etiology, or an autoimmune inflammatory process occurring among patients with a common non-disease specific genetics, perhaps um, initiated by some exogenous uh, trigger uh, or drug or microbe. There is debate <coughs> as to whether or not some of these represent a single disease or spectrum of single disease uh, or distinct entities, but really um, the pathogenesis is unknown. We can't really comment on that. And then we also must differentiate these from, uh, from neoplastic diseases such as MAR and CAR. Um, autoimmunity does occur uh, frequently in patients with white dot syndrome, syndromes, not only uh, in the patients, but among first and second degree relatives, suggesting that an, inf an inherited type of immune dysregulation may be common among patients uh, with uh, white dot syndromes that predisposes to autoimmunity. Nevertheless, the, um, nevertheless, with the variable lesion morphology and evolution, these can be clinically subdivided into distinct uh, entities due to their distinct natural history and their visual prognosis. 
This is extremely important in terms of uh, disease-specific indications for treatment, as we will see, and it's illustrated by the cases. The thing that has really revolutionized our ability to differentiate white dot syndromes is multimodal imaging, uh, such as color photograph in this patient with MUSE, fluorescent angiography, ICG angiography, OCT, high definition OCT and OCT uh, angiography, and fundus autofluorescence in this patient with uh, serpiginous indicating an area of activity, the choroidal new vascularizations seen in this patient um, with an inflammatory choroidal new vascular membrane. The utility of multimodal imaging is, uh, is extremely helpful diagnostically. There are certain patterns um, and type of vascular involvement that really help us in making a diagnosis clinically. Uh, more importantly, it gives us an idea of the uh, structural abnormalities that, that are associated with decreased vision, including optic nerve inflammation, macular edema, retinal vasculitis, neurosensory retinal detachment, coronal vascular membrane, and then uh, with the advent of high definition OCT, structural abnormalities in the outer retina that can be very subtle, that cannot be appreciated clinically, but are appreciated um, uh, on, uh, with multimodal imaging. Finally, multimodal imaging gives us an idea of the extent of active inflammation, which may not be readily apparent clinically. Um, this certainly alters one's treatment threshold and offers us um, a very uh, sensitive modality for monitoring treatment. So we're going to begin with uh, Dr. Feist, who's going to tell us about birdshot retinochordopathy. So my, I'm presenting on bird shot. So just kind of a basic definition. It's a clinically distinct white form of the white dot syndromes. It's predominantly among uh, middle-aged uh, women, white women of uh, northern European descent. So you get these characteristic uh, bilateral hypopigmented inflammatory lesions at the level of the RPE and the choroid. They emanate from the optic disc in a nasal, predominantly nasal and the radial pattern. Um, again, like most of the others, it's not an infectious cause, but a putative autoimmune mechanism because there's such a strong association with HLA-A29 positivity, and uh, so much so that I guess a lot of the people are doubtful of, of the diagnosis in patients that are A29 negative. And then it's a predominantly ocular disease in otherwise healthy patients. So this is the research uh, requirements uh, for study. So patients required to have bilateral disease with at least three peripapillary birdshot lesions. Um, there's typically low-grade vitreous inflammatory reaction, which is less than 2 plus vitreous haze. And then it's also supported by the presence of HLA-829, retinal vasculitis, and uh, cystoid macular edema. So you get a mild non-granulomous iridocyclitis, uh, but this is predominantly posterior disease. Um, so again, low-grade low vitritis, but the classic multiple post-equatorial ovoid cream-colored uh, lesions that can range in size from 50 to 1,000 microns. Uh, you also get retinal vascular leakage, and then there's notable absence of snow banks, and then uh, peripheral near vascularization is uncommon. Um, so this didn't segment well, but uh, the differential diagnosis, like with all of these, is ex it's important to exclude other kind of treatable causes. So uh, infectious categories, so uh, syphilis is one of the, the main things that you'd worry about, but also TB, histoplasmosis, and then dusen. Um, and then non-infectious, this is also a kind of a, a good age period for people to develop lymphoma, so another thing to think about there. Um, but just can't kind of hinge the diagnosis just on the imaging alone. So this was a patient of Dr. Vitalis. She was a 16-year-old woman that was initially seen in an outside hospital. She complained of about a year and a half of uh, just kind of decreased vision, nyctalopia, and floaters. Um, she was referred to him. Her vision was actually good. I think she was yet uh, 20, 20, or 2040 when he initially saw her. Normal pressure, just very mild AC cell, a little bit of vitreous cell, um, and then peripheral exam showed no uh, no snowballs, no snow banking or anything. And then you can kind of make it out here, but you start to see these kind of creamy lesions here. So this is just a close up of some of those that you're able to see. So not, not quite as impressive as some of the other ones in the book, but still a good example. So like Dr. Vitali was talking about the, the kind of the new thing in uveitis is more the, the imaging. So OCT is something that we're pretty much all able to get and it's very useful. 
Um, the, the characteristic findings with birdshot are the, the macular edema, and it's also useful not only for following the response to treatment in terms of the macular edema. So up on this top OCT, you see the cysts there, which have responded after treatment, um, both systemically and locally. But you can also monitor the ISOS junction and for other, other changes in the outer retina that can reflect the visual function. Um, over time, if it's poorly treated, it can show uh, macular atrophy. And one of the newer one of the newer things that's coming out is uh, with the enhanced depth OCT. They're starting to comment on some uh, kind of hypofluorescent areas in the choroid, which might be predictive of development of macular edema as well. Uh, fundus autofluorescence is something I, I don't know. I, I feel like we get it a lot, and I don't always know how to interpret it, but uh, it can be useful um, for identifying other lesions that aren't clinically apparent. Um, this was a picture from one of Dr. Spade's papers on using fundus autofluorescence. So you can see the, the white dots pretty, pretty prominently in the infranasal periphery. Um, and, you know, there's a suggestion of some, you know, subtle kind of macular changes, but they show up quite well actually on the fundus autofluorescence. So it can also be useful for delineating other areas of involvement. Fluorescein angiography is useful, but not in, not in the sense that you'd always think. It's, um, it's kind of interesting because the, the birdshot lesions aren't very characteristic on the FA. They can uh, mask early for fluorescence and stain late. They can, they can show different patterns, but they're not classically thought of as uh, showing up on the FA. One of the main utilities is for identifying vascular leakage and macular edema. Uh, so this is just kind of a, a mid phase, or sorry, a little bit later phase, just showing some segmental periphlebitis and then angiographic evidence of macular edema. So this is uh, that same patient of Dr. Vitale's in the other eye. Uh, so just the, um, just the regular colored fundus photo. Can't really appreciate the, the peripheral lesions quite as much on, on this little image here, but you know, you're not really seeing too much in terms of the peripheral stuff on the fluorescein angiography. You do see a little bit of leakage at the disc and then just very early segmental uh, periphlebitis. So you get vasculitis, which prominently involves the vein, venules rather than the arterioles. And then later you start to develop more angiographic evidence of macular edema. ICG angiography is kind of one of the more helpful tests that we have. They show well delineated hypofluorescent choroidal lesions um, that are mo more prominent in the mid and late phases of the test. Um, you can also see some fuzzy appearing uh, choroidal vessels as well, kind of indicating the, the, both the retinal and the choroidal involvement of the disease. Um, this is just a mid phase of the ICG, so you see these multiple uh, kind of hypofluorescent choroidal spots. And then in the, this is just kind of comparing that to that same picture as previously. So see, see more macular involvement here on the uh, ICG angiography than you do clinically as well. So that's kind of one of the, one of the useful uh, portions of this test. And then just in the later phase, they show up even better. Electrophysiological testing is also quite useful. Um, classically, it shows a preserved, birdshot shows a preserved A wave. The B wave amplitude uh, is reduced and there's increased latency time. Um, with a, and then the other characteristic finding is a prolonged 30 hertz flicker implicit time. Um, this one doesn't, didn't show it quite as well um, as some of the other ones and I just couldn't find a, a good picture of a, a ERG that showed it, but this was uh, Dr. Vitali's patient as well. Um, you can also get elevation of the dark adaptation thresholds. Um, but one of the, the useful things with the electrophysiological testing is that this and the, uh, the visual fields can actually show improvement after uh, immunomodulatory therapy. So it's useful, for, one, for making the diagnosis, but also for monitoring the response to treatment. And so the, the basic goal of the treatment is aimed at preventing global retinal dysfunction. So as you can tell from the electroretinogram, and just clinically, that this involves the, the entire mac or the entire retina, not just the central macula. Um, this kind of the point that Dr. Vitali was wanting wanting me to make with this was that this is this is a disease where prompt tr prompt systemic treatment is very helpful in the long term. Um, it classically begins with oral steroids, which are used as a, in a bridging rule um, while you're starting immunosuppressant therapy. Um, so usually begin with an anti-metabolite, so things like methotrexate, Celsept, or Imuram. Um, and then depending on the clinical response, you can add a calcineurin inhibitor like cyclosporin or tacrolimus. 
Um, failing this, you can also advance to biologic therapy, so things like Humira or Rumicade. And then Redisert has been a, a useful tool in, in patients not tolerating systemic therapy. Um, this was a patient of Dr. Shakur's. I wasn't able to like, get the rest of the pictures loaded up, but um, this was a person that came to him after a, a diagnosis of Birch about 10 years prior, had not ever been treated systemically, only with um, local injections of steroids, so either intravitreal or subtenons kinolog. Um, so you can see the, the classic birdshot lesions, and then there's also a lot of kind of macular atrophy centrally. This is their OCT, so you've totally lost your outer retina detail. Um, it's not showing up. Um, just kind of diffuse macular thinning and loss of the ISOS junctions um, throughout. So that's, you know, you've, you've lost your photoreceptors in this, in this case, and so it's not conducive to vision. And this is the ERG late, um, so it's just it's totally flat and then just reflects the global retinal dysfunction. So that was my stuff on Birdshot. Do we have any questions? No questions? We see a lot of Birdshot here, actually. Yeah. We really do. Um, it's a rare disease, you know, about 7% of uh, posterior uveitics, uh, you know, but uh, we see a lot of them, a lot of Northern European patients with Birdshot. Um, I think that the last case dramatically, you know, illustrates the need for kind of prolonged therapy in, in these patients. Uh, local therapy, you can be fooled into, or fooled into thinking that you're treating the macular edema and there's no the usual indices for, uh, for inflammation like uh, anterior segment cell or, or heavy vitritis just are not prominent in patients with birdshot. But as uh, this graphically in, illustrates, there's global retinal dysfunction. And if you treat just episodically with perioperative steroids or even a course of systemic corticosteroids, you have a stepwise decrement in the function of the, uh, of the retina. So the, the problem is who, when do, you, when do you start treatment and how do you convince the patient with good vision that uh, they're gonna treat? So the natural history studies suggest that 85% of patients do poorly on monotherapy with the corticosteroids. Um, there probably are some patients that do well, but it's impossible to identify who those people are. Uh, so, uh, in patients that come in that are symptomatic, that have structural abnormalities like macular edema or retinal vasculitis, which, are, which is difficult to actually appreciate clinically sometimes, but was, as recent showed, uh, you know, we could see promptly uh, with uh, wide field fluorescing angiography. Those are, those are indices of active inflammation. Um, and uh, frequently patients will come in with visual field changes or uh, abnormalities in their electroretinogram. So those would be indications for treatment, even patients with relative good vision. Uh, and so we need to kind of convince the patient that it's in their best interest in the long run to be treated with uh, immunomodulation. And I think that with, you know, with, for people that uh, are familiar with using that medication, that patients do actually pretty well. I have two other thoughts on this, in part it's from a meeting we recently had at AUS, but with birdshot, Following visual acuity is about is as helpful as following visual acuity in glaucoma. So central visual acuity for an indices of um, birdshot activity is just not helpful at all. Um, and on the flip side of that, patients' symptoms and complaints can be very helpful. So they'll tell you um, having some weird photopsias or decre decreased contrast sensitivity and in birdshot especially, it's something very important to listen to as, as a sign of activity. That's a very good point. Uh, visual acuity is a terrible marker for following patients. That's why we use visual fields and ERG. And the patients really do have these peculiar, uh, sometimes the patients are peculiar, you know, and, uh, and they also have peculiar uh, complaints. But you really, like William Osler said, you know, listen to your patient, they'll tell you what's going on with them, they'll tell you what their disease is. And it's particularly true for a child. So thanks very much.